what we do today is to present you a very simple Keynesian macro model. Uh, you might have at your university already uh, have been uh, familiar with macroeconomic models, the ASNM model, model, the ASAD model. Um, and uh, what we want to show you here is, is a simple model in Keynesian style, uh, which we think is very appropriate for an understanding of basic macroeconomic processes. I think uh, what characterizes this model is that um, it does not uh, speak about the price level, but about inflation. Uh, it does not represent monetary policy as a change in money stocks, which you have in the ASLM model, but as a change in the real interest rate. And overall, I think it's, it's a very simple model. Um, it is also characterized by something which you do not find in most textbooks, it explicitly deals with shocks, supply shocks and demand shocks. It introduces them in an explicit way. And I think that really helps to understand how monetary policy can react to, to such shocks. And it also avoids that you, that you uh, present monetary policy in a very flawed way. So in some textbooks, uh, when the authors introduce monetary policy, they start from a situation without a shock where everything is in equilibrium. Then suddenly the central bank becomes active, increases the money stock and the increase in the money stock has a temporary increase uh, in, in output as, as, as a consequence. Uh, the price level goes, goes up and then and inflationary expectations go up. And after some time, everything uh, uh, subsides and then you go more or less back in a kind of equilibrium situation. But when you start, discussing monetary policy from a situation where the economic is in equilibrium, monetary policy can only disturb uh, the economic system. It's a little bit the same thing if you try to teach students of medicine the effects of antibiotics and you take just a group of very healthy people and you feed them very strong antibiotics, uh, you will see that they get all kinds of problems, all kinds of symptoms. And maybe after two weeks, uh, these symptoms vanish again. But if you then explain the students, that is the effect of antibiotics. If you have healthy people, they eat antibiotics. They have lots of problems. It's a kind of distorted view. But that's something you find quite often in macroeconomic textbooks that in a healthy economy, suddenly out of the blue, the central bank becomes active. And of course, there's a lot of confusion. And that makes no sense. I think from understanding of monetary policy, and also from understanding of antibiotics, it's important that you first have a shock, something that disturbs the system, uh, and then the therapy sets in, and only then you can describe how the therapy effectively works. I think that's what we do here, that we explicitly uh, deal with shocks, and that's something to my mind my, 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 that you do not find in all other uh, multidisciplinary textbooks. Okay, so now we have the strong one, we have to do this one, this one. No, but then, sorry, but now we have various words. Ah, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so, so here's the model. Relatively simple, three equations, and more or less, you are already somehow familiar with these equations. We have an IS curve, which is really Keynesian. Um, I must say that people thinking classical terms also use IS curves because they say consumption is determined by the interest rate, and we have seen this is intertemporal optimization. So you can interpret the S curve as a Keynesian S curve, where investment demand reacts to uh, the interest rate, but you can also interpret it as a classical uh, curve, where the intertemporal consumption decision uh, responds to the, the interest rate. So we have an S curve, we have a Phillips curve, we already talked about that. and um, then we introduce the central bank uh, with a, what is called a monetary policy curve, a monetary policy uh, equation. And this is uh, re uh, represented by a loss function. So, and we have the shocks here, epsilon one, epsilon two. And I think the best thing is if you go through these equations, you see it's relatively simple, three equations. Uh, and the model is called ISMPPC model. And this kind of model you can find in many textbooks. It's now kind of standard 
way of discussing macroeconomic policy, but you also find it in uh, more complex uh, macroeconomic new Keynesian models. They all have this structure with these three equations. Um, they, as far as the monetary policy uh, uh, equation is concerned, you can have different uh, equations to, to discuss monetary policy. You can uh, use a Taylor rule instead of the loss function. We'll do this also in some weeks. Uh, but the basic structure is structure that you find now in many textbooks, but also in, in many uh, more complex market models. So the AS curve um, uh, shows the uh, relation between the uh, output gap, that's Y, and so the main relationship is the output gap and the real interest rate. So the idea is output is determined by the real interest rate and there's a negative relationship if the real interest rate goes up, uh, there will be less equity demand, output will decline and you can do this via investment demand or via consumption demand. So this is, uh, and it's important here in this kind of, uh, of models that monetary policy is expressed by the real interest rate, not by the nominal interest rate. So when we have this simple uh, SLM model, it's normally the nominal interest rate uh, and not the real interest rate, but it's, it's, of course it's much better uh, to, to, to work with the real interest rate. So very simple um, equation, um, negative relationship between real interest rate and output. They fear our uh, shock term, and this is a demand, demand shock, epsilon one. Um, and uh, A is kind of is autonomous uh, demand component and B uh, represents the impact of the real interest rate on output. So let's. Uh, we just re received a question. Is this the real interest rate of the classical model? No, that's very good, very, very important. Um, uh, this term real interest rate is, is used very differently. So in the classical model, the real interest rate is always a commodity interest rate. And in this model, the real interest rate is a money interest rate deflated with the inflation rate. But it's very important that you ask this. Thank you very much. Yeah. And there's often a lot of confusion uh, about, about this. Okay, that's the IS curve. Then we have the Phillips curve. We already talked about uh, the Phillips curve. Um, and the Phillips curve uh, shows the relation between the output gap and the inflation rate, pi. And um, we also talked about this. Uh, expectations of mandate Phillips curve, the idea that our actual inflation rate is determined by inflation expectations. And uh, where, where does this come from? Well, we assume that we have in the uh, economy, longer term contracts, especially wage contracts for let's say one or two years in advance. And then people are making these contracts, of course they have to ask themselves, how will the inflation rate develop? And so in today's wage contracts, the expectation of inflation tomorrow, or let's say in one or two years, is plays, plays an important role. And that's what you can see here. The expected inflation rate is, has an impact on the actual inflation rate due to these longer term uh, nominal contracts. So here we have epsilon two, which is our supply shock. D describes the impact of the output gap on, uh, on inflation. And uh, I think we said this before, uh, the output gap also stands as a, as a uh, representative for, for the employment situation. So we assume for this kind of Phillips curve that there's a very direct relationship between employment situation and the output gap. And of course, if you have a negative output gap, we assume we have unemployment um, because um, we, two, two weeks ago, when we discussed the Phillips curve, uh, we said that originally the Phillips curve was derived for unemployment and inflation. Uh, and in today, many, many uh, models uh, do not uh, take the Unemployment rate or the employment situation be substituted by the output gap. Okay, so this is uh, the Phillips curve in our model. And um, 
for simplicity, we assume uh, in, in more basic uh, discussion of these models that uh, PE, the expected inflation rate, is identical with the target inflation rate, uh, P star of the inflation rate. Uh, when we do this, we assume that the central bank is credible, that when people form their inflation expectations, they ask themselves, what is the inflation target of the central bank? And they take the inflation target of the central bank as uh, the inflation expectation. Of course, and, and when people behave like this, when the expected inflation rate is uh, identical uh, with the inflation target of the central bank, we can say that the central bank is credible. And this equation also shows us how important it is for a central bank to be credible, because if people uh, anticipate uh, the inflation target of the central bank in their Phillips curves, in their contracts, then you have a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. So if, if pi star is in the Phillips curve, then you kind of automatically get uh, the infla inflation rate that uh, corresponds uh, uh, with the inflation target of, of the central bank. Okay, that's our Phillips curve. And then we have the loss function of the central bank. So that's uh, how we uh, represent monetary policy in this simple model. And here we assume that the loss of the central bank is determined by the inflation gap and the output gap. The inflation gap is simply the difference between the actual inflation and the inflation target. Um, and um, um, and, uh, uh, and the output gap is what we have here. Um, and uh, the, the loss is, is determined by these two uh, gaps and by, by squaring the output gap and the inflation gap has the effect that we don't have to differentiate between negative and output, negative and positive gaps, and that large deviations uh, are, get a stronger weight than small deviations. And the factor lambda uh, shows the importance that the central bank gives to the output gap relative to the inflation gap. So if, if lambda is zero, uh, then you have a central bank that only cares about inflation, one talks about inflation matters. Um, so central, which, uh, central bank which doesn't care at all about, about output, and of course the larger lambda uh, the greater lambda, the stronger is the, is, the, is, the, is the importance of the output stabilization or employment stabilization uh, in the policy of the central bank. Okay, and, and as I said, yes, we can also hear an alternative for monetary policy, is the so-called Taylor rule. We will discuss this in more detail in some weeks. The Taylor rule um, is a rule which prescribes the real interest rate uh, that the central bank uh, should, should target. And the, according to the Taylor rule, uh, the real interest rate that, this, that which the central bank sets is determined by a kind of neutral equilibrium, real interest rate R star plus 0 0.5 times the inflation gap plus 0 0.5 times the output gap. So you again have the output gap and the inflation gap uh, in, the, in the Taylor rule. Um, this looks somehow similar, but we will we discuss in more detail see that it leads to somewhat different results. Okay, that's our model, very simple, three equations. And um, I think we don't discuss the mathematics here now. I think we did that already um, in the, uh, already yesterday. I think the important thing is that uh, in this model, you get a kind of optimal real interest rate, which, central bank should try uh, to, to target. And you can see this optimal real interest rate is, uh, depends on the shocks. If you have the demand shock and the supply shock, um, that we have a kind of neutral interest rate, A divided by B. So if, if the two shock terms are zero, uh, then you have this neutral interest rate. And um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, this optimal interest rate depends also on lambda, on the importance of uh, the output gap stabilization in the loss function of the central bank. Okay, relatively simple mathematics you did already, or will do. And so 
it goes through it just in, uh, through the through the graphs, and um, so we start with a um, optimum situation, equilibrium situation. I think that's very important when you discuss policies that we start the situation without a shock. Um, and graphically, we have here our IS curve, downward sloping, depending on the real interest rate. We have here our neutral real interest rate. We have here our output gap, uh, zero output gap, and we have here our uh, inflation uh, at its target value. And we have here the, the, our Phillips curve, and the Phillips curve assumes here that the expected uh, inflation rate is uh, identical to the target rate. So that's our starting position. We have everything is in equilibrium, credible central bank. And um, so now comes the shock. And um, we start with a negative demand shock. And uh, the negative demand shock shifts the IS curve downwards. And um, we then get new equilibrium here uh, on the on the goods market. So we have a negative output gap here. And now we translate this negative output gap on our Phillips curve. And then we also get the inflation rate for this for this situation. And now we can see we have both. We have here negative inflation gap because now the inflation rate is below the inflation target, and we have a negative output gap. So that's the direct impact of the negative demand shock on uh, the system. And what can we do? What can the central bank do? Well, the answer is relatively simple. Um, the central bank just reduces the, the interest rate, um, the real interest rate, in a way that we get that now for the new, um, for the lower, uh, IS curve, uh, we, we come back to uh, to zero output gap, and with the zero output gap, then we also come back from the situation with the negative inflation gap back to our inflation target. So that's as simple as that. So if you have a demand shock, here we have shown it for negative demand shock, but it also works, of course, for positive demand shock, which goes the same direction. So the central bank can uh, stabilize uh, the situation with its interest rate. And what really matters, there's no trade off between the stabilization of output and the stabilization of the interest rate, of the inflation rate. And that's very important when you have this kind of shock um, that there is no trade off. Um, and this is not, uh, uh, not seen by all authors in the same way. So in the Menkyu uh, introductory book, Menku teaches the students already on one of the first pages, there is always a trade-off between output stabilization and uh, price stability. Um, there's always this trade-off and it's not true. And, and why uh, does he come to this result? Because he does not start from a situation after the shock has occurred. And when you're in a situation without a shock, then you always have this trade-off. But if you have a demand shock, Positive or negative, the important thing is there's no trade off. And I think this is more or less the situation that we are facing today, uh, or since about, since about a year. Uh, corona is, of course, COVID pandemic is a huge demand shock. And uh, so for the central bank, it's obvious uh, if they remain passive, uh, the result would be a huge deflation and, of course, a huge uh, negative output gap. And so central banks and, uh, of course, fiscal policy together uh, by stabilizing the situation, they prevent deflation. At the same time, they prevent negative output gaps. So there's no trade-off in, in this situation between output stabilization and employment, and output stabilization, employment stabilization on the one hand, and uh, inflation stabilization on the on the other hand. And here, that's this uh, quote from from Mengyu, where he said. Um, Society faces a short run trade off between inflation and unemployment. And as I said, the problem is he assumes a situation where there is no shock. And of course, then you have this problem. But if you 
if monetary policy sets in after the shock has happened, then there's no problem. So it's quite interesting. So this maker has 10 principles, kind of 10 commandments, and uh, one can easily show that this principle is not, does not always hold. I think Mengjo is not 100% wrong, uh, but it really depends on the shock that you have in mind. So far we've talked about a demand shock, as we see it this, this, this COVID, uh, but the economy is also confronted with supply shocks and supply shocks. Um, I think an important example for supply shocks uh, are the prices of, of, of energy, of raw materials, but also if, if you have uh, uh, wage increases that, that are very strong. So these are all factors that increase uh, the inflation rate. Um, and um, the demand the supply shock we can represent by a shift of the Phillips curve. And what is important when we talk about positive uh, or negative shocks, um, that do not want to say these are good or bad shocks. Uh, it only shows the sign of, uh, of our shock terms, epsilon one or epsilon two. And um, a positive demand shock simply means that epsilon uh, two is greater than, than zero. So it's very important uh, to, to, to see that this does not mean value judgment with good or bad shocks, it's only the sign. So if you have a positive demand shock, positive supply shock, for instance, if the prices of energy go up, if what we can see today also that price of raw materials increase, uh, then we, this is expressed in our model as a shift of the Phillips curve. And um, so if, if we have this shift in the Phillips curve, what, the, what is the initial impact? The initial impact, if nothing happens, central bank remains passive, we get an increase of the inflation rate and we get a positive inflation gap. And the question is now, how can the central bank deal with this? Um, and um, we, yeah, we have, we have seen it here. Um, so so what, what, what can, what can, how can the central bank deal deal with this, of course, the central bank can try to get uh, the inflation rate, the higher uh, inflation rate, so if here this is higher inflation rate, and uh, the central bank can now try to get uh, the inflation rate back to its original level, it increases the real interest rate. And so uh, we move to this point A. So that inflation is of course, uh, in line with its target, but of course we get a negative output gap. So we can see, okay, here we have a demand shock. It's not so easy for the central bank. The central bank has to ask itself, what do, what do I prefer? What, what is more important to me? And, um, and, of, and of course, we can see also the, the opposite uh, uh, solution that the central bank says, okay, I want to, I want to stabilize uh, the income. So that, that's what we've discussed. Uh, so it remains passive. So there's two, two solutions. B is passive policy, doing nothing, let just the inflation rate increase. Uh, and uh, A is trying uh, to, to stabilize inflation, but then accepting the uh, higher output gap. And so how can this trade-off be solved? Well, this can be solved uh, by applying our loss function, because the loss function then tells the central bank how, what is the importance of an inflation gap relative uh, to an output gap. And uh, we can, we graphically, we can show the loss function as a, as a circle. So assuming that lambda is one, and the circle around the, what we call bliss point, the equilibrium, uh, the equilibrium situation where we started, and then we can see if a central bank uh, follows a loss function, it will neither choose the situation with output gap zero, nor the situation with inflation gap zero, but it will try to, uh, to achieve a compromise in order to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the, the two gaps, because we know from the quadratic form of this loss function, larger deviations uh, create higher losses. And so the central bank tries to minimize the, the losses of each of the output gap and the inflation gap. Okay, so we see definitely, yeah, there's, there's always 
um, um, trade-off. And uh, let me now talk soon about the ECB's policy. Uh, we can see how the ECB deals with this kind of, of trade-off, because we have these supply shocks from time to time uh, with major increases in oil prices. And uh, here we can see it's not so easy to find the optimum solution. Okay, so uh, we, we've got one more question. Yes, the uh, MP um, equation. Uh, there's no R in the uh, MP function. How does the central bank um, control the MP uh, we, line? We assume that, that I think that's what all these models do. They assume that the central bank can directly control the real interest rate. That's what all the very fancy. Uh, new Keynesian models do, they do not talk about how the central bank controls it. We will show you uh, soon how the central banks in practice control interest rates. But for these kinds of models, it's just assumed that the central bank can set the real interest rate where, wherever it wants it uh, to have it. Yeah. That's a question important, yeah? It's, it's, it's a valid question, how can the central bank control this real interest rate? But uh, well, models are abstracting a lot from reality. And these sort of models do not uh, discuss uh, the, the way how central banks uh, target uh, interest rates and they simply assume the central bank can control the real interest rate. Stop. Okay, so then we can just now uh, summarize uh, the, the main implications of the model. If you have demand shocks, no trade off, supply shock, there is a trade off. How the trade off is solved depends on the preferences of the central bank for inflation stabilization uh, versus output stabilization. And uh, yeah, what, what I think what's also important um, is of, of course the, the Keynesian flair uh, of, this, of these models is of course the central bank is a force for actor in economic stabilization. It can control uh, the whole system. Of course, there are limits to this, the so-called zero lower bound of interest rates uh, where the central bank uh, reaches the, the end uh, of its of its room for maneuver and here then the fiscal policy must come in we will talk about this um, and um, yeah what was also important of course that inflation expectations play an important role in this model uh, we have assumed that this is very short uh, uh, discussion of the model that this, that uh, private uh, agents believe that the central bank is credible so that they their inflation expectations are equal uh, the inflation target um, but of course this can change uh, inflation expectations can deviate uh, from the inflation target these are the so-called second round effects of supply shocks and we will discuss this in a minute okay then i would say we stop here make five minutes break and then uh, we, we got one more question yeah. um, with respect to the trade of um, supply shocks. Uh, if central banks pursue also environmental goals, green monetary policy, is there a trade off with inflation in a situation where energy prices are rising? That's a good question. So far, that's the first time somebody asked about, us about uh, green monetary policy within this model. A very good question. Um, and uh, well, I think. Um, so if energy prices go up in a kind of gradual process, I think that's not so much a concern for, for the central bank because energy price is one price among other, among other prices. And so higher energy price, if it's a kind of longer term process, I think that's what we are now facing uh, in the next, next few years. This must not lead to inflation because the, the impact of energy price is not that high. And I think what we discuss here in this framework are very short-term increases in energy prices that uh, happen from time to time uh, and which then also will be reverted after some time. Yeah? So it's this, is this kind of shock nature of, of energy price. And I think if you have a gradual increase of energy prices due to how higher taxes on, on carbon emissions, I think this is not something on which a central bank would, should, should react, would react because I think their impact then on the inflation rate is not that high. But no, that's a good question. So we never, never discuss uh, green uh, aspects within this, this kind of model. Okay, let's have a short break here before we... So, welcome back. Um, after a lot of theories, uh, we now uh, want to focus on policy. 
I mean, that's the idea of this uh, course that we start first with a kind of uh, theoretical background. And now we want to apply this to monetary policy, to fiscal policy, and especially in the euro area. I think it's a specific feature of this course that we explicitly address uh, the euro area, the institutions of the euro area, the specific problems uh, that are um, associated uh, with the, the monetary union. And I think this also kind of innovation because most of the textbooks uh, that you normally read are written from American authors for the United States and then some quick adaptations made, some, some, uh, uh, some, some yeah, adjustments made, but you can see that these textbooks are not explicitly made for European uh, perspective and especially not for a Euro area perspective. And um, what we want to do now is first talk about the European Central Bank uh, and then also on European uh, fiscal policy and then also on the specific uh, problems that uh, are uh, associated uh, with the monetary union. Okay, so the ECB is at the heart of the monetary union. Why uh, this European monetary union is a kind of hybrid uh, animal uh, because we have a full integration of monetary policy and the European Central Bank is the institution which is responsible for monetary policy in the euro area. But uh, in contrast, we have no integrated fiscal policy for the euro area. We have 19 national fiscal policies, 19 national member states with 19 finance ministers, 19 uh, prime ministers and chancellors. Uh, and so this is, of course, one of the main challenges of the euro area uh, that we have on the one hand, this full monetary integration, on the other hand, this very incomplete political integration. And uh, of course, this leads to a lot of lots of problems. Anyhow, so the ECB is the key institution of this euro area because it's the only institution that is a supranational institution that has a supranational responsibility um, in, the, in, in the Euro area. And now it's quite interesting when we think about these philosophies, these paradigms of uh, economics, um, the classical paradigm on the one hand and the Keynesian paradigm on the other hand, uh, we can see that from its philosophy and when the ECB was established, uh, it's very much influenced by the classical uh, paradigm. And you can see this in a booklet and book that the ECB has published about 10 years ago, uh, where the ECB describes the philosophy uh, of, its, of its policy. And uh, there you can nicely see how these classical views dominate the philosophy of the ECB. So in this booklet, the ECB says, since monetary policy can ultimately only influence the price level in the economy, price stability is the best contribution that a central bank can make to economic welfare and to long-term growth prospects of the economy. It's exactly what we said. We discussed the classical model. There is no role for the central bank to interfere with real processes. The real processes are determined by saving investment of household and and investors, there's no role for the financial system in this uh, real core uh, of, the, of the economy. And the only thing in the classical model that the central bank can do is to uh, influence uh, the price level of the inflation rate. And that's exactly what, what this uh, ECB publication says. This is quite interesting then, and also exactly 100% the classical view, assigning monetary policy and objective for real income or employment would have been suboptimal. Since monetary policy has no scope for exerting any lasting influence on real variables in the short to medium term. No effect of the real of the financial sphere on the real uh, sphere, even in the short to medium term. No effect at all. Of course, if you take this uh, seriously, the question is hard. How then can the ECB influence economic activity? 
uh, in the euro area, if it has no effect on real variables, the short to medium term, what, what is, what is the, the transmission process? What, what gives the, uh, the ECB a lever on the economic activity in the, in the euro area? And um, well, we have just seen it when we discussed our very simple uh, Keynesian model that the only way how the central bank can influence inflation is via its effects on output. We've seen that with the real interest rate, the central bank targets output and output then has an effect via the Phillips curve on inflation. So it's key for monetary policy that it has an impact on, uh, on, on real variables in order to have an impact on inflation when the economy is uh, hit by demand or supply shocks. So it's quite nice that we just discussed in this simple model uh, how the central bank reacts to shock and shocks and how it can control the inflation rate. It can control the inflation rate only via um, by its effects on real variables. But here, of course, that's what the ECB does. But, but it's nice to see how the ECB describes its philosophy, which is 100% classical, no effect on real variables in the short to medium term. Only the price level in the long term. And here, maybe, maybe the only way uh, then how you can have an effect uh, is, is either via some kind of helicopter money drops, or I think we have, of course, an impact um, on inflation uh, via the inflation expectations in the Phillips curve. So there is, of course, an effect of the central bank on inflation in the medium and longer term via inflation expectations. And if as a central bank you are able to be credible, uh, and then uh, people form the inflation expectations in accordance with your inflation target, then of course you can have kind of medium term, longer term effect on the economy. But, but whenever you are confronted with shocks, this is not enough. And then in order to stabilize inflation, you also have to do something uh, uh, via real variables. And uh, so here, then according to this philosophy, it's the task of other economic policy makers notably those responsible for fiscal and structural policies to smooth real economic activity in the short term and to directly enhance the growth potential of the economy. So the idea is kind of division of labor, short-term fluctuations uh, are the task of fiscal policy, not of monetary policy. And monetary policy is kind of uh, uh, providing a, a stable uh, nominal environment without interfering in the dirty daily work of our conservation. It's really nice where you can see how this uh, classical view shapes the ECB's philosophy. You will see in reality, this is not how the ECB uh, behaves, but it's nice how the, how the ECB at least uh, tries to, to present its, its philosophy in these classical terms. Okay, so price stability is the main task of the ECB. Uh, and um, we will go through these different uh, aspects of this, of this mandate of the ECB. We'll talk about uh, price stability as the ECB's objective. We'll talk about the ECB's definition of price stability. We'll ask, is there a trade-off between price stability and high employment? We'll talk about the division of labor between fiscal policy and monetary policy, because it's not as easy as the ECB describes it is the interesting uh, aspects of this, of this assignment uh, in, in dealing with shocks. Then we will talk about the pot potential conflicts between price stability and financial stability. And we also ask, can the ECB contribute to climate policy? So this is a very uh, ambitious agenda. I hope we will make it both you as audience and I as presenter to get through this agenda. But uh, I think we have to uh, speed up a little bit because uh, the end of the semester is not near, but it's, it's getting closer. So let's start. So the ECB's mandate, price stability is enshrined 
in the so-called Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, this is a kind of, of the kind of constitution for the European Union. It's also the constitution for the ECB because all essential elements of the institutional setup of the ECB are uh, laid down in this Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And this treaty says the primary objective of the European system of central banks, which is the ECB plus the national central banks, shall be to maintain price stability. Very clear mandate. And then it goes on and says, without prejudice to the objective of price stability, the ESCB shall support the general economic policies in the Union with a view to contributing to the achievement of the objectives of the Union as laid down in Article 3 of the Treaty on European Union. So while price stability is the overarching target objective of the ECB, uh, this does not mean that the ECB should neglect other important uh, policy objectives, and these policy objectives uh, are laid down in the Treaty on European Union. And so we go to the Treaty uh, on, of, of the European Union. And this uh, Article 3 says, the Union shall establish an internal market. It shall work for the sustainable development of Europe based on balanced economic growth, price stability, a highly competitive social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress, and a high level of protection and improvement of the quality of the environment. So the objectives here remind us uh, to the objectives of the kind of general uh, macroeconomic equilibrium. So uh, in addition to price stability, of course, uh, unemployment also matters. And, um, and balanced economic growth, I think we also uh, talked about this uh, objectives in our very first uh, lecture. And um, so by referring to these objectives in the ECB's mandate, um, it, it, the, the, the uh, founding fathers uh, of the ECB uh, uh, clearly had in mind that the ECB sh should, should have a look at these other targets, should not neglect them. Um, they did not talk about the trade-offs because the, the ECB's mandate gives priority to price stability, but as long as there's no problem with price stability, the ECB can also try to achieve the other targets. And um, what matters nowadays above all is this uh, reference to quality of the environment. So if we talk about uh, responsibility of the ECB for the environment, one can derive this responsibility directly from this Article 3. Okay, one dimensional price stability, but not uh, neglecting other important uh, targets as long as this does not interfere uh, with price stability. Uh, it's quite interesting to compare the ECB's mandate with the mandate of the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. And here you can see uh, that this is not a one dimensional uh, mandate, it, it has there are three dimensions, one can say, uh, because this mandate says uh, that the ECB should promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. So here you can see a different approach uh, where the central bank is also held responsible for uh, high employment and also, what's quite interesting, for moderate long-term interest rates. So maybe... Uh, this could lead to conflicts right now in the United States and the administration is now embarking on a very ambitious uh, expenditure investment program. And uh, the question is, uh, when will uh, the uh, central bank react and, uh, and is the central bank willing to allow an increase in long-term interest rates? And in fact, in the, in the early 1950s, there was a conflict between the government and the central bank in the United States, uh, when there was huge, very huge uh, expenditures uh, for, the, for the Korean War and inflation rate went up and the government went to the central bank said, you should not increase long-term interest rates, but the central bank increased long-term interest rates in spite of the strong uh, warnings of the government that the central bank could, could create a lot of harm. So the central bank did not 
did not uh, keep interest rates low. Anyhow, so you see this is a different approach, um, price stability and high employment. And I think if we, if we look at the policies of the ECB and the Fed in the past, uh, one can see that the, uh, that the Federal Reserve has been more actively trying to, to stabilize the economy, to react to the unemployment situation than, than the ECB. So I think this definitely had an impact on how these uh, central banks uh, behaved in a in, uh, situation of, of major economic shocks. So how is this is then price stability defined? Price stability is, is, is something that needs clarification and the ECB, while, while the, uh, while the EU, EU treaty has just been relatively vague in, in uh, describing in, 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 in term price stability, the ECB then tried to clarify uh, the, the concrete uh, definition of price stability and the ECB did that uh, in 1998, one year before uh, the ECB started its operation. And so the ECB said, okay, uh, price stability is defined by a price index. And so the price index is a uh, index of consumer prices uh, in, in the member states. And it's, it's a harmonized index. So, so the prices are collected in a uniform way in all the member states. What is important, uh, the ECB is targeting a price index for the whole euro area. So developments in individual states are not taken into account. And I think that's logic uh, of a monetary union. So the ECB can only react to developments in the whole uh, currency area. It cannot respond to situations in individual member states. I think that's good and bad uh, because it, it implies a one fits all policy. Um, and it can have the consequence that the average, that the, that the, that the uniform interest rate that the ECB uh, determines for the average situation in the uh, euro area is an interest rate that it might be too high for some countries, too low for other countries. So that's always a problem when you have this kind of one fits all approach. And this is a major problem of monetary union and we will talk about this problem in, in more detail. Okay, the time horizon for the ECB is the medium term, which means that the ECB does not react to, must not react to, to very short term uh, uh, fluctuations of the inflation rate. Um, the target value for inflation is an inflation rate of below but close to 2%. That's a little bit strange wording, but it's, the ECB in um, 1998 defined the target first as an inflation rate of below 2%. And then people ask, well, below 2%, does this mean uh, an inflation rate of 0.1% is still in line with the ECB's target? Um, and the ECB said, no, this is not what we really want. And that's why they added, and when they revised the ECB strategy in 2003, they added close to, one could also say 2%, but anyhow, the ECB, that's the way how the ECB phrases it, but more or less it's an inflation rate of somehow 2%. Uh, what is also important um, is that this target is uh, symmetric. So it means when you, uh, when the inflation rate is above the target, uh, the ECB responds, responds in the same way as when the the inflation rate is be below the target and then over the medium term means if you had a period where for some years uh, the inflation rate was below the target then for some time uh, the inflation rate can also be a little bit above the target. That's a similar definition as uh, the Fed uh, uh, Chair, uh, Chairman Powell has, has given uh, last year in uh, Jackson Hole where he said we, if, if he want to have an average uh, inflation target of 2% over time, then after a period where inflation was below 2%, there must be some years where inflation is above 2% because otherwise inflation expectations will then go below 2%. If, if, if we do not allow for some time, 
somewhat higher in flick rates. So, okay, that's the definition of price stability. And uh, of course, the uh, a target of below but close to 2% raise the question, why not 0%? Because if you take price stability literally, it means that the price index remains constant over time. The constant price index means zero inflation. And um, so why did the ECB decide to have 2% instead of 0%? And you will see soon that this is the way how almost all other central banks decided uh, to, uh, to uh, define their targets for, for price stability. And I think the answer is relatively simple. So if you, if you have a zero uh, target inflation and you are in a situation uh, where the economy is more or less in equilibrium, then if you take as a benchmark a neutral uh, uh, interest rate, uh, neutral uh, real rate of of two of of two percent, then uh, with zero inflation in equilibrium, situa equilibrium situation, two percent real rate, the nominal interest rate should be two percent. This then implies if the economy is affected by a negative shock, the central bank can only reduce the interest rate by two percentage points from, zero, from two to zero, because then comes a zero lower bound. And so it means that the ability of the central bank to respond to shocks with an interest, with the short interest rate is limited. If you have an inflation target of 2% and you're again in equilibrium situation for full employment and so on, you assume that the neutral real interest rate is 2%, then you add the real interest rate of 2%, you add the inflation rate of 2% in equilibrium, then you have a nominal interest rate of 4%, and then you have four percentage points that you can use as the central bank to respond with your interest rate interest, interest instrument to negative shocks. I think so that's the main uh, uh, explanation for a 2% inflation target uh, instead of a 0% inflation target. And in the specific environment of a monetary union, there's also another explanation uh, for 2% inflation target. Because if you have a 0% inflation target in the monetary union, it is always an average inflation target. And that means with a zero inflation target and 90 member states, there must always be some uh, member states who are in deflation. Because some member states are above 0%, some, are, then some must be low 0%. And that would mean that you uh, accept a deflation uh, in, in, in your member states as a, as a situation, even when, when there are no shocks uh, in, in the economy. So then uh, the economy is, is, is affected by negative shocks. Then the countries are already in deflation. When you are in equilibrium, of course, they get even into more deflation. And therefore, I think the uh, special rationale, specific rationale of the 2% inflation target in a monetary unit is that you, that you prevent uh, member states from being in a deflationary situation, even if there are no, no negative shocks. On the other hand, there are also some economists who ask why shouldn't we have 4% uh, inflation as an inflation target? I think Mr. Blanchard also has um, made this, this proposal, or at least has, 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 has discussed this idea. But then you would see in a, in a monetary union again, the 4% on, as an average inflation target, the monetary union, then we would have a lot, number of member states with an inflation rate of more than 4%, and that I think is quite a lot. And therefore, I think that's also not a good idea. So overall, I think 2% is not a bad idea. And um, I think that's also kind of consensus among central banks, uh, if you see here, if you're, uh, the target inflation rates of central banks in, in many advanced economies, they can see most of them have 2% higher inflation targets you can find in some uh, developing countries. Uh, but in advanced economies, there's a kind of consensus of, of 2%. Um, and so I think yeah, the, the rationale is, is relatively clear. Um, it really helps you, uh, the central bank, to, to deal with negative shocks. 
and to have some distance from the zero lower bound in a situation where you have a kind of equilibrium situation. Okay, so um, the ECB uh, has been relatively successful to keep uh, the inflation rate uh, uh, line uh, with the inflation target. So this is not, so in retrospect, it seems clear, but uh, it's not so obvious. So in Germany, uh, when the first discussions on a monetary union in Europe started, so in the early 1990s, there were lots of professors of economists who said, this European Central Bank will not be able to achieve a uh, stable low inflation rate. Well, there were manifestos by professors, famous professors that now the ECB will never uh, be able to achieve low inflation rates. And here you can see, well, more or less, the ECB has been quite uh, uh, successful in keeping the uh, inflation along this 2% uh, target. Of course, some periods inflation rate was higher, some periods was lower. Um, but um, you can see here also the uh, the effect of, of energy prices. So the light blue is the uh, harmonized index of consumer prices, HICP. And you can see that it's, it's been more volatile, uh, relatively volatile in some years. And that's in order to exclude the short-term fluctuations of energy prices on inflation. The ECB is always publishing the uh, so-called core inflation uh, rate. And the core inflation rate is the inflation rate, HICP inflation rate minus energy prices minus unprocessed food. And here you can see uh, that this uh, indicator, this core inflation is cost fluctuating much less than, uh, than the uh, HICP inflation rate. Um, and I think that's an important indicator uh, which shows kind of longer term uh, price trends in the economy, the deep deeper uh, inflation processes. And uh, what you can see, uh, especially in the, in, the, um, in the last 10 years, is or last six years, is that, uh, that uh, the uh, euro area has been in a, in a process where core inflation was consistently below the uh, inflation target of the ECB. Uh, and of course, this explains why the ECB in the years 2014 uh, onwards has been purchasing large amounts of government bonds in order to prevent def deflationary processes in the, uh, in the euro area. Um, so uh, yes, overall, the ECB has been quite successful, but uh, we can see in the last six, seven years, it was a little bit difficult uh, to, to come closer uh, to the inflation target, and we'll see soon that this also has something to do with the fiscal policy in the euro area, which was very much uh, dominated by austerity policies, by governments who try to reduce their, gov their, their deficits, and uh, which then exerted a kind of deflationary effect on the economy, and uh, which you can see here in this, in this uh, inflation, uh, core inflation and inflation below the inflation target. Right now, maybe just, just to, the, to, the, to the situation right now, um, if, you, if you open the newspapers you, <laughs> and also on, on the internet, you must have the impression that now inflation is, is really uh, the very, very serious threat for the macroeconomic situation in the euro area. Uh, but um, if you look at, at the data, the HICP inflation rate of the euro area is just 2%, more or less close to the target. And what is more interesting, the core inflation rate of the euro area is 0.9%, so far away 2%. So I think one can be relatively relaxed um, for the inflation outlook in the euro area. This is different in the United States where uh, we talked about uh, the uh, government transfers to the households are extreme, where the government deficit is twice the government deficit in the euro area, where also the unemployment situation differs fundamentally. So uh, the unemployment rate in the United States is, will be, uh, according to all forecasts, below 4% next year, while in the euro area it's, it's about 8%. So also from the labor market, the Phillips curve. 
uh, there's also a kind of inflation risk in the United States. So um, when talking about inflation, one should really differentiate between the euro area and the United States. Even, but even for the United States, I don't see a situation where we get now uh, accelerating inflation rates, let's say leading to six, seven or 8% inflation or 10% inflation rates. Okay, so, and, and yeah, only just to give you some perspective uh, on, on this uh, inflation performance of the ECB and the German fears that such a European central bank would generate a lot of inflation. Here you see the inflation rate in Germany um, and, uh, and the Bundesbank, German Bundesbank, which was in charge for monetary policy from 90, 1948 to 1998 in Germany, was very proud of its inflation performance, but you can see the average inflation rate in Germany was 2.8%, so it was above the inflation target uh, of the ECB. And with the ECB, uh, after Germany has abandoned its monetary policy autonomy, the inflation rate was, was only half the inflation rate of the, of the Bundesbank area. Of course, these were different times, so there was more inflation in the global economy in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, there was a kind of moderation uh, all over the world, but it's quite interesting to see that the Germans who were so much afraid of uh, inflating the European Central Bank that they still, that they now have the advantage of having a lower interest inflation rate with the ECB than uh, with the Bundesbank. So why is price stability so important? Why is it overall a, a main target of, of, uh, of the central bank? And um, I will not discuss this in too much detail, but the underlying idea is that um, we have a economic system in, in, yeah, in our in each, each uh, countries, but also in the global market, which is based on, the, on a very uh, complex division of labor. And, com and division of labor also means that you have an exchange of products over, over markets. And uh, this very differentiated system with global supply chains and which, which, which is very productive and also contributes a lot to the well-being uh, of nations. So the main idea of Adam Smith was division of labor is a key uh, source for uh, key driver for the wealth of nations. That was Adam Smith's idea. So the more division of labor we have, the more uh, the economic well-being of, of, of societies will be, and that's exactly what we did with globalization. And so if you have a, a system with a global division of labor, you have an exchange via markets, this whole system is organized and orchestrated by the price system, by the signals of the price system. So, and, and these signals uh, organize the whole allocation of resources in order for the system to function efficiently, it's important that the price signals are transmitted in a clear way to the producers and to the consumers. And price signals can only function uh, if prices, if the price system uh, as a whole is, is stable. So if, if uh, we, we do not have inflation and uh, we, we need, uh, stable, stable inflation rate and, and low inflation, because in this in this uh, whole uh, system, uh, money is serves as a kind of of yardstick. Money helps as a, as a unit of account, which helps to measure to compare prices. And for money to serve as its unit of account as a yardstick, um, the, this this yardstick must be relatively stable over time. So if a meter, if, if a meter varies over time, if sometimes a meter is this, and then a meter is more and even more. So if, if the definition, uh, the content of, 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 of the unit of account varies over time, it gets useless. And so for money to serve as a unit of account for this uh, market system, uh, it is important that its value remains relatively stable over time can change a little bit, but if it changes too much, then this whole system of prices, which organizes the whole global division of labor breaks down. 
Therefore, price stability is extremely important. And of course, um, price stability also matters because many people uh, want, want to have a safe asset. Many people do not want to speculate on the stock exchange. Many people do not want to buy Bitcoin. Many people want to have at least some part of their wealth in a, in a safe, uh, uh, safe asset. And here money not defined as bank deposits uh, are, are, are in demand as a safe asset. And this is only then also possible if we do not have inflation because otherwise this safe asset no longer exists. And then people get any problems here. You can see uh, the, the, the price the prices of gold and, and of, of shares, of course, they're increasing a lot, but they can also decline. And while some people have a preference uh, for risky assets, um, other people want safe assets. And here, money in the form of bank deposits is, is a safe asset. And of course, it can only uh, fulfill this function as a, safe, as a safe asset if the inflation rate is somehow relatively low. If you have 40, 50% inflation, then it's difficult for people to have any kind of safe assets. And then uh, we get a kind of, if people are not, not um, have no excess of, of safe assets, then of course uh, you get also problems uh, with the allocation of financial markets and people buy all kinds of things, uh, even, even if they are not, not very uh, productive. So yeah, uh, so for, for money to serve as a store of value, inflation must be relatively low. Okay, so then come to the next point. And I think we have addressed this already with our model, so we can be relatively short. The question, is there a trade-off between price stability and the goal of high employment? At the first side, one could say, well, this one-dimensional focus of the ECB's policy on price stability, does this not mean that, uh, that Employment is not uh, not sufficiently um, in the in the in the mind of the of the ECB that that uh, with the focus on price stability uh, the ECB is willing to accept high unemployment rates and isn't not the unemployment situation even more important than price stability and so is this this one dimensional mandate of the ECB not not a, a matter of concern and in fact, there are from time to time economists saying, okay, uh, the ECB should abandon this one-dimensional mandate uh, uh, in favor of a two-dimensional mandate, price stability and uh, employment like the mandate of the Fed. So where does this one-dimensional uh, mandate come from? Well, it comes, of course, from this kind of classical uh, uh, approach, but it also reflects a little bit the experience that was made in the 1980s. And the 1980s were a period where we had relatively high inflation rates all over the world. Um, and um, the interesting observation was that countries with high inflation rates also were countries that had problems with the employment situation. You can see it on this, on this chart. So you had countries um, like Spain or Belgium that had relatively high unemployment rates and relatively high inflation rates. And here Germany was a country with a relatively low um, inflation rate, relatively uh, low unemployment rate. Uh, Japan and, and Switzerland also two countries, relatively low inflation rates, relatively low unemployment rates. So it became obvious that at least over the medium term, there is no trade-off between unemployment and, um, and inflation. Uh, and so in this kind of medium term perspective, I think inflation is a little bit like alcohol. So if you have unemployment problems and you try to solve your unemployment problems with inflation, uh, you might end up uh, with both uh, the unemployment problem plus the inflation problem, maybe the same thing if you have uh, psychological problems, you know, try to stop them with alcohol, uh, then over time, uh, in addition to the psychological problem, they have also a problem with the alcohol. So using inflation systematically to improve the employment situation is certainly not a good idea. And I think this observation 
uh, of the 1980s also was something that was widely shared. And that's why when the discussion on the European Central Bank started, there was a relatively strong consensus. If we will have a European Central Bank, then it should be really focusing on price stability um, and not on a, on a dual mandate. Um, and for the short-term perspective, I think we've already discussed it. Uh, the focus on price stability is not a problem in the situation of demand shocks because demand shocks move the inflation rate and output in the same direction. Uh, so if then the central bank starts to deal with the shock, there is no trade-off. I think we have, we have discussed this uh, already um, when we have here this uh, situation. We get so if we a, then we have our negative demand shock. So the IS curve shifts down when we come to point B, and in point B, we can see we have both we have here an output and inflation gap, and we have an output gap. And then if the central bank uh, responds with a lower interest rate, reducing its interest rate, then uh, we shift in position C, um, and here this A and C is identical. So we close the output gap, and uh, and we can uh, bring back inflation to its to its uh, target level. So that's the good news. Uh, so the focus on price stability is not a problem when the economy is confronted with demand shocks, positive or negative, and uh, what we already just discussed, of course, things are different. If we have a supply shock, then um, I think we have, we have discussed it just quite now. Situ in the situation of a supply shock, then of course the central bank has to decide: will we stabilize uh, inflation? Will we stabilize output, or will we decide to have some kind of, some kind of compromise? So here, uh, the focus on price stability can create. Uh, can create uh, trade-offs for the central bank. Um, but um, when we look at the uh, experience uh, of the last uh, 20 years, I think the problem was not so, uh, was not so severe um, because, um, also I think with this we've already discussed, we shifted. It was not, not so severe because when we had this, uh, the supply shocks that was here in the, 2008 especially, and again here a little bit in 2011. So we had strong supply shocks. Um, the effects on um, supply shocks caused by higher energy prices, uh, the effect on the inflation rate was relatively temporary and due to the medium term focus that the ECB has explicitly stressed when defining uh, its, its target, the ECB, there was no need for the ECB to respond directly to these, to these shocks. And so with the medium term orientation, the trade-off uh, between uh, inflation and output stabilization can be mitigated by this medium term perspective. I think that's something that is really, it's really helpful. Um, but of course, supply shocks can become a problem if they lead to so-called second round effects. And, um, and this is something that now might play a role maybe in the United States when inflation is now starting to accelerate and second round effects mean if due to temporary shocks, the inflation rate goes up and the inflation rate deviates from the inflation target of the central bank, then uh, it might have an effect on the inflation expectations of the private sector. So and as soon as uh, the inflation expectations now uh, start to drift upwards, start to deviate from the inflation target, then of course the central bank uh, has a problem, and we can see it here, um, uh, where we have uh, now um, a. So we start here. So we have, it's not here. We have here a, a starting situation before it was the Phillips curve before the shock, and if we then have a shock that shifts our Phillips curve upwards, and I think we've just discussed this. Um, the situation gets gets difficult if, in response to this shock, then uh, the, uh, the the private sector 
revise its, its inflation expectations upwards. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, with this, with the Phillips, with the, with this Phillips curve, uh, the situation for the central bank gets difficult because then it can now only realize uh, uh, situations that are on this, on this shifted Phillips curves and they, they are on a uh, more outward circle. And uh, this means on a circle with the higher loss function. So this is something that the central banks, uh, will, will, all central banks will monitor carefully. When you have supply side shocks, will they have an effect on ex if, uh, inflation expectations? And if inflation expectations drift upwards, then there is a problem. And normally then central banks really respond with very restrictive policies to get inflation expectations down again, because as, as we have seen, inflation expectations are crucial for the actual inflation rate. And if inflation expectations get out of control, it's very difficult also to control the inflation rate. And so supply shocks, if they only have a kind of temporary effect without affecting inflation expectations, I think the central bank can uh, allow the effect of these shocks on inflation. But as soon as supply shocks affect, affect the, the inflation expectations, then normally central banks react quite aggressively uh, to, to, to such shocks. Okay, so we have discussed the trade-off and then I would like to discuss something um, which, which so far has not received a lot of attention uh, in, the, in the academic debate or in the policy debate. Um, that's the role of fiscal policy in dealing uh, with inflation and the responsibility of fiscal policy for inflation. So in the philosophy of the ECB, uh, it's the ECB that is responsible for inflation and it's the governments, the fiscal policy that is responsible for the short-term stabilization of, of output. But uh, one can of course ask the question, is, is this an adequate assignment? Is it not also possible or even necessary that also the government is responsible for inflation and if the government and the central bank are responsible for the inflation, how do we then uh, design the division of labor? And this is something which is often addressed as a so-called assignment problem in macroeconomic policy. Who is in charge uh, for inflation and, and for, for output civilization? So um, we can see in our, in our very simple Keynesian model, we can include uh, the government in our IS curve as, and as, a, as an additional uh, element of, of, of the IS curve. And, um, and, and uh, with its expanded choice, of course, the government can shift the IS curve as, as, an, as an additional argument in, in this IS curve. And so uh, with, the, with, with its effect on the IS curve, of course, uh, the government can also target uh, can also target um, uh, inflation. Yeah? So, um, for instance, if we have here a negative, we have assumed here a negative demand shock, so the, the IS curve shifts downwards. We get here lower, lower uh, uh, inflation, and we can have now a situation of an, of an output gap and negative inflation gap. But instead of the central bank uh, reacting uh, to, um, to uh, uh, the shock. Fiscal policy can also react to the shock and can try to shift the IS curve back to the, its original position. So that we then, so this is A, B, and now we shift it back. So that's so A and C. Uh, so in the same way as the, as the central bank can restore uh, equilibrium, of course, fiscal policy can also restore equilibrium. The question is now who, uh, who is in charge when we have shocks? And here we have the, the idea that the government is responsible for price stability is not so, um, not something very exotic. Uh, we have already talked about the functional finance of Eva Lerner, who is the kind of founding father of modern monetary theory. And he explicitly talks about the responsibility of the government to keep, to maintain macroeconomic equilibrium. 
And he says, if we do not have macroeconomic equilibrium, uh, and if aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply, we will get inflation. The other way around, we get unemployment. But he explicitly talks about the responsibility of the government to, to maintain macroeconomic equilibrium in order to prevent inflation. Now you might say, well, our learner and this MMT, they're a little bit exotic guys, but interestingly, in Germany, with the so-called economic, the act to promote economic stability and growth in Germany, which was uh, decided in 1967, which was a kind of uh, time when uh, Keynesian policies were very fashionable in Germany. Um, and this act explicitly stipulates the responsibility of the of fiscal policy for the overall macroeconomic equilibrium. And uh, then um, it's, it's, it says the measures of the government uh, shall contribute to price stability and a high level of unemployment. So there's an explicit responsibility of fiscal policy in Germany for price stability. And that's, that's quite just interesting because normally people only think it's only monetary policy is in charge of price stability. No, um, fiscal policy can also have a responsibility for price stability. And, uh, and but this idea that this policy has a responsibility for price stability has somehow been forgotten, especially uh, in the situation after the, uh, after the financial crisis. And uh, one can show this, I think, quite, quite nicely for the euro area. And uh, I think we start with the, uh, with the chart on the left side. And um, here we have, um, the inflation target of the central bank, the ECB, and the dark blue is the inflation forecast. And the inflation forecast for two years ahead, so the ECB um, organizes a so-called survey of professional forecasters, which on a regular basis produces inflation forecast. And one could see that, in, that after the financial crisis, about 2008, that the inflation forecasts were deviating downwards, especially in the years 2014-15. So there was a kind of deflationary environment emerging. So and the next step is that we look at monetary policy. And here the gray line is our zero lower bound. And the blue line is the short-term interest rate, the ECB. And the interesting thing is that once we, the price developments uh, came into this kind of deflationary environment, the ECB already was at the zero lower bound, more or less uh, at the limit of its traditional uh, monetary policy. And, um, and so, in this situation, a responsibility of the governments for price stability would have been quite helpful. So because we could see, well, the ECB uh, has reached its, its traditional limits. And so what we would need is, is uh, fiscal policy to step in and to help to get out of this kind of deflation environment where uh, the central bank can no longer actively stimulate the economy. And here it's quite interesting. Uh, and here we have the government expenditures your area, the real government expenditures, and maybe it should be a little bit marked with zero because then we know where we are. And you can see that after this period, in the same period when we had this kind of deflationary environment, government expenditures, real government expenditures in the euro area were more or less stagnant. So the government did not contribute to economic growth. It was a break for economic growth because in the euro area, government expenditures are close to, I would say, 45% of GDP. And so if 45% of the GDP, which are under the control of the government, are more or less stagnant, it's not surprising that you do not have very much growth. And here you can see a good example where the macroeconomic policy assignment did not work. But the governments pursued austerity and created a deflationary situation, the central bank was at its limits and could not really do very much 
to to help the euro area out of out of of, of deflation. And here, of course, a a um, cooperation between the fiscal policy and monetary policy would have been helpful, especially in Germany. So in Germany, everybody complains about low interest rates, but here you can see that's the light blue line that even in Germany, who had a relatively solid fiscal position um, in this period, um, the increase, and at least until 2015-16, the increase, real increase of government expenditures was relatively low. And so Germany, who is so unhappy about the low interest rate, could have changed the situation by boosting government expenditures, creating more growth in Germany, uh, and then also creating more growth in the euro area, and then for the ECB, uh, it would not have been uh, necessary uh, to purchase so many uh, government bonds and interest rates would have been higher. So it's quite interesting that the Germans who complain so much about low interest rates have been actively contributing to this kind of deflationary situation in the euro area. Um, and um, the uh, responsibility of fiscal policy for uh, inflation is, I think, is also something which is of special relevance in a monetary union, because if countries are confronted with spe country-specific shocks, uh, the ECB cannot deal with these shocks with its monetary policy. Uh, if, even if it tries to react to shocks, the, the, the interest rate response is not strong enough for the country that is confronted with a country-specific shock. In addition, the reaction of the ECB also creates problems for all the other countries do not have a shock. Now, and therefore, it's also useful in my view uh, that in a monetary union countries also, fiscal policies also try to deal with country specific shocks that have an impact on the inflation rates. And you can see it quite nicely here in the early years of the monetary union when countries like Greece or Spain uh, get inflation rates in the range of more than 3% in, in, in Spain and, and Greece. That would have called maybe for a little bit more conservative fiscal policies in these countries would have helped to also to, to prevent the, the huge booms uh, that, that uh, especially the real estate sector in these countries. And on the other hand, in Germany, uh, where the inflation rate was also deviating quite a lot down, down uh, for, uh, in, uh, in, in, was, was lower than the inflation target of the ECB, more active fiscal policies would have been needed. So, and, and of, of course, in, mon in monetary union, the effectiveness of monetary policy uh, is, is uh, reduced the more the national um, inflation rates diverge, because here in this situation, uh, with relatively high inflation rates in Spain and Greece, the real interest rate in these countries was below average. And in Germany, with the low inflation rate, the real interest rate was above uh, the average. So you had kind of destabilizing effects of the, of the, uh, of the uh, uniform uh, interest rate policy of the ECB. And therefore, we can say, especially the monetary union, it might be also useful if the national governments see some responsibility for price stability, because this contributes to a more effective interest rate policy for the uh, euro area. So we have two points left. I think, I hope we will make it, but I think we'll be relatively short. So we have now talked about uh, trade-offs between price stability and unemployment. Uh, a problem that was not uh, envisaged by the founding fathers of monetary union uh, are problems um, in the financial, financial sector uh, of the your area financial stability was not something that was uh, very intensively discussed in the 1990s. But of course, we had this uh, financial crisis uh, and the euro area, some member states of the euro area were very severely affected by this financial crisis. And uh, in my view, uh, there was a problem that the ECB was one dimensionally focused on price stability, not taking into account what was happening in the, on the financial markets of some member states, on the housing markets of some member states. Uh, and as ECB did not react, um, some of the member states were really very severely affected by these uh, destabilizing processes on the uh, financial markets. And 
it's quite interesting that uh, the ECB, uh, with its focus on price stability, did not really uh, take into account what was going on in the years 2007 and even early 2008 uh, on the, in the financial system. And so, so I fear a, a quote from uh, President Trichet in July 2007, that was about two weeks before one could see that something is really going wrong in the, in the financial system uh, of the, the euro area. And so he said, yes, given the vigorous monetary and credit growth in an environment of ample liquidity. So somehow he talks about this credit growth, the credit growth was excessive in these, in these years, showing the chart. But then he says, a cross check uh, of the outcome of the economic analysis with that of the monetary analysis supports the assessment that the upside risk to price stability prevail over the medium to longer term. So it's only price stability and that the house was already burning or was really close to, to burning is not something that the ECB was, had been addressed at that time. It's even remarkable. So uh, even almost one year later, uh, the ECB wrote a monthly bulletin uh, on, on the occasion of its 10th birthday and if you read this bulletin, it's the ECB praises itself and uh, its wonderful achievements for the euro area. There's not a single word uh, about the growing uh, instabilities in the financial system of the euro area. And, and when this bulletin was published in, it was in May 2008, you could really see that how this house was burning. So that's the problem of this, um, of this one dimensional approach. Mm -hmm. I think you have shown you a similar chart. So one could see the, the enormous increase in uh, loans uh, in the euro area, uh, which also led to an increase of the money stock. And I've shown you this chart. This was this increase uh, in bank lending was, uh, uh, was concentrated in some member states, especially countries which had a lot of problems, Ireland, Spain, Greece, while in Germany, nothing happened. But so, this, there is a risk if, if, if the central bank is, is one dimensionally focused on, on price stability that it really neglects what's happening in the financial system. But I think there's a lot of learning uh, in the ECB and, and that means something like this hopefully will never happen again. And, um, and so one of the, uh, one of the uh, additional instruments that we have now at the disposals, as disposal are instruments of macro prudential policy. So they mean that the ECB must not necessarily raise interest rates. If you see a credit boom and a housing boom, this macro policy, macro prudential policy means you have very specific instruments which, which aim at reducing the risks in the uh, housing market, in mortgage lending. And there, for instance, there are upper limits uh, for the mortgaging of real estate, so-called loan to value rates, ratios. There are upper limits for the burden of interest and redemption payments in relation to a borrower's income, loan to income ratios. And there are also uh, additional capital requirements for bank lending, so-called leverage ratios, I think. So there has been a learning process. And I think, yes, there's always a kind of trade-off. Uh, if the central bank wants to raise interest rates to prevent uh, excessive lending and excessive real estate processes, because if the overall market economic situation is not so stable, there could be trade off. But here, I think these instruments of macro prudential policy really help a lot. And so hopefully we will not see the same problems as we've seen in the years 2005 to 2008. So finally, that's of course a big topic. And uh, now we're at the end of a long lecture, uh, climate policy. Um, I will very shortly address it. Maybe uh, we can also think of, of uh, organizing a separate discussion on it uh, because it's very, you know, very topical uh, uh, issue. And, and um, we'll talk more about the ECB strategy. And uh, when uh, President Lagarde came into office in December 2019, she immediately announced a comprehensive strategy review. So the ECB's original strategy was uh, designed in 1998 and there was a kind of uh, revision in 2003, but obviously this strategy needs 
a, a very thorough uh, uh, reform, and, and that's what President Lagarde has announced. But due to the pandemic, of course, it will take, take a little bit more time until this uh, strategy, new strategy uh, will be developed and presented. And one important element in this strategy is climate policy. So the idea, what can the ECB do, do to help uh, to fight climate change? And uh, I think we already talked about, yeah, so that's the announcement by uh, Christian Lagarde uh, in, in uh, December. And um, as you said, we will include in our strategy the immense challenge that climate change is addressing to each and every one of us. And of course, the, the basis, we already said this, uh, is uh, the Treaty on European Union, Article 3, we don't have to repeat that. So there is a justification for the ECB to deal with climate change as long as this does not conflict with its prime, prime uh, uh, target objective of, of price stability. And um, so the question is, how can the uh, ECB uh, do something to fight climate change? I think what should be clear, uh, the main responsibility for climate policies lies with the national governments and the European Union, which have also the most powerful instruments. And instruments to deal with climate change, I think we all know these are carbon taxes, um, uh, it's, it's financial support for renewable energies, it's maybe also investments in, in all kinds of transportation networks, in uh, investments uh, to, to uh, make uh, the whole uh, housing sector more energy efficient. Um, so there's a lot to do by the national governments and, and, and this, this, these are instruments uh, by, by of, of fiscal policy. A lot, of, a lot of monetary policy. And one can also say, well, uh, this will cost a lot of money um, and, and will require uh, debt financing, at least a uh, major part of these, of these investments uh, that have to be made. Uh, but still, this would not require uh, that the ECB becomes active. So as long as countries are able to finance themselves, uh, by the capital markets, we could say, let, let countries decide what is necessary to do uh, to fight climate change. And then if money must be raised to finance it, if deficits are required, let the countries try to get the money from the capital markets. And in my view, uh, the ECB only has to step in if countries are no longer able to raise the money, the funds that are needed to deal with climate change on the, on the capital markets. And then, one could talk about uh, responsibility for the for the ECB. So I think the main um, task of uh, climate policies is with national governments. Uh, and so the question is, what can the what can the uh, ECB do uh, now to promote climate change? And something that has been discussed so far is that the ECB uh, should give a preferential treatment to green bonds in its corporate bond purchases. Uh, we'll talk next week about uh, the ECB's uh, asset purchases and uh, the ECB has a corporate uh, bond purchasing program. So it's not only purchasing government bonds, it's also purchasing bonds from major uh, corporations in the euro area. And so the idea is that when purchasing uh, such bonds, uh, the ECB should pay uh, attention to the um, energy efficiencies and efficiency or in a, in, uh, uh, of, of such companies. And in a, in a uh, lecture that Isabel Schnabel has given, uh, she showed that right now the ECB holdings of uh, corporate bonds uh, have a bias towards uh, industries that uh, have very, very high emissions. I think that, that's what she shows. Uh, emissions that are relatively higher than uh, the average emissions of, 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 of the total of the total economy. So there is right now not a neutrality uh, in the bond purchase is a bias towards uh, high, ener high energy intensive industries. Uh, and so one idea is um, that uh, the uh, ECB should now when, when it purchases uh, 
corporate bonds should pay more attention attention to the uh, uh, emission intensities of of the companies and this way uh, then uh, establish a kind of market neutrality. But there are of course other possibilities uh, how the ECB could uh, try to deal with climate change. But I would say we stop here because we had now very uh, ambitious, <laughs> comprehensive uh, presentation of the ECB's target and mandate. I hope you liked it. I apologize for uh, this uh, very long presentation, but I thought it's the best thing now we do it uh, in, in, one, in one lecture instead of dividing it up. So if you are still aware and present, dear students, thank you very much for uh, listening, for attending. And if you have questions, of course, you can do that. Yeah, we had uh, two questions, quick questions. Uh, if the whole monetary union would profit from national responsibility for price stability, why is it not supported more actively, especially with regard to the heterogeneity of the EU? That's a good question. So um, I'm asking this myself. Um, and um, the, the notion that the national governments have a responsibility for price stability is not so obvious. Uh, and I must say, I explicitly discovered it just two weeks ago uh, in an article that I wrote for Social Europe. And I think we can give you the link to this article. Uh, and of course, I, I, I was inspired by Abba Lerner and uh, explicitly talks about this responsibility for price stability. Then I, uh, I, I reminded myself of this uh, German uh, uh, Stability and Growth uh, Act of 1967, where we also have this explicit um, mentioning mention of price stability. And the interesting thing is, in the uh, monetary union, um, we have a, a mechanism to to monitor uh, macroeconomic disequilibria in the member states, the so-called macroeconomic imbalance procedure, and we talk about that. Which, which has the aim to, 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 to find out is there a macroeconomic imbalance in an individual member state and how can individual member states deal with this macroeconomic imbalance. But interestingly, this macroeconomic imbalance procedure has many indicators, but not price stability. And of course, it's in order to, to make uh, such a, a responsibility for price stability uh, uh, to, 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 to make it work, uh, one would need inflation forecasts for the member states, and then, then identify are there inflation forecasts for member states that deviate from the 2% of the ECB, and then ask how can the individual member state deal with the situation. So that would be the mechanism, so to say, would need inflation forecasts, compare it with the inflation target, and then say, okay, can, so for instance, in Spain or Greece, uh, in 2002, 2003, you could say, well, the inflation forecast is 3%. Maybe that's not a very large deviation, but nevertheless, is there something the countries can do to, to prevent uh, acceleration of inflation and so on? But this is not, not there. And um, yeah, I, I'm surprised for myself, but as you can see, first time I talked about, wrote about this, uh, joint responsibility was, was about two weeks ago in this article of Social Europe. So. Uh, and then a second question um, could be specific. The Deutsche Bank has recently published a consensus out of uh, consensus forecast in which they are warning about a global time bomb due to rising inflation. Their line of argument is that if monetary policy of the Fed remains expansive, it will lead to permanent high inflation and the central banks won't be able to respond appropriately without setting the interest rate to about 20%. What's your take on that? Well, um, so I'm, I'm not, not uh, I do not believe that the Fair Reserve would not react to an increase of, of inflation. So of, of course, if, if they have temporary spikes, now we have this 4%, uh, that's not yet in my view uh, enough for a strong response of, of the Fed, but um, if especially if inflation forecasts go up, whether it's explicit inflation forecasts or inflation forecasts embedded in financial market prices, so I would assume uh, 
uh, that the Federal Reserve will respond. I, I, I cannot uh, imagine that the, that the Federal Reserve would allow uh, an acceleration of inflation. And, and what is important, uh, if central banks are willing to fight inflation, they can fight it. That's the main difference to deflation. So if, if you have deflationary development, you have to see all over about uh, where you can, they can do relatively little as a central bank. But uh, if you have inflation, it's not a problem for central banks to act. And of course, you must create timely. Uh, that's true. So you cannot wait until inflation is 10 or 15 percent or so. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that the, that the Federal Reserve will not allow a, a significant acceleration of inflation in the United States. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, the patience and for, <laughs> for staying with us for such a long time. I hope you somehow enjoyed it and I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Bye. -bye.